Trictoid. I'm the, one of the two principals at Concentrated K. Our website is k-vitamins.com. And the last time I did this video was somewhat a cappella, and now we're going to do it a little more professionally, which is fine. I will be fielding questions. I will make sure everyone hears what the question is, because I will repeat it. And I will make uh, every effort possible to uh, present things in a very cogent and uh, rational fashion. So with that, uh, purpose of the talk being as close to Valentine's Day, we're talking about heart disease and all that stuff associated with the heart. There is an awful lot of hooey out there with regards to heart disease. And I'm going to cover the hooey in a little more detail than I did in September of 2017, which was, was the last video. So I'm going to start off with something kind of unique. And I'll see if we can get this video taped in here or, or zeroed in. See this right here? Got it? Yes. Okay. And I've got something for everyone here. So I'm going to pass this out. Pass these out. There you go. Kind of like the old sing-along with Mitch. We're going to pass some stuff out. Everybody got some stuff? We've got, here we go, a couple more back there. All set. Anybody like another one just to bring home for their friends and family and co cohorts? And Okay. Okay, there we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here. Okay. Now, you take a look at this, and we're going to start with the basics. Okay, folks? We've all heard of calcium scores, right? CT scans of your heart to get a calcium score. Down here in this little corner is me in 2002. I had a calcium score of 350. And 337 of that 350 was in my left main. And I was given not too long to live by a very prestigious clinic just south of Minneapolis. The purpose of this chart is to show you some really interesting things. Per the literature, which is really cool, you either have a doubling of your calcium score every year, it goes up by 52% every year, or it goes up by 22% every year, or it goes up by 15% every year. Now, you see the little skull and crossbones up there? That's when you're dead, or pretty darn close to it. Okay? Follow it? Just, just look through that really slow and easy. Now, here's a couple of takeaways on this. And you have heard this from the medical world. Oh, you get a calcium score, and I just heard this from a prestigious hospital in Green Bay. We're only going to allow you to be tested every five years because it doesn't really change. Honest to God, that's what they told me. Pretty cool, huh? Well, it does change. And here's the thing about it changing, and this is what needs to be drilled down to everyone. When this changes, that means you have something growing in the artery of your heart. That's what a foam cell is. It's something from your body that's growing in a part of your body that doesn't belong growing in your body. So that doesn't sound too good. So whether your score progresses at 5% per year or 50% per year, you've got something growing. And if it's growing, it has a reasonable chance of popping through and causing, like that clinic said, a cardiac opportunity. Okay, that's how this works. So, let's further drill down. If you see that first dotted line, that's where, by 2005, I completely cleaned up my left main artery. It went from 337 to zero. According to the literature, that isn't supposed to happen. But since my heart didn't read the literature, it says, okay, I think I can handle this. 
Other things occurred and yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to get into all the other things, but this is the salient point. In 2012, I had finally gotten my D, or my D and my K, and my thyroid, and my magnesium very well balanced. But the key in all of this was getting my K. I discovered K in 2010. Prior to that, I was eating a lot of sauerkraut, a lot of broccoli, a lot of kale, which are all K-containing things, but I didn't connect the dots. Remember, I've got about 16,000 hours now of reading into this stuff starting in November of 2002. So, you know, by 2010, things, I had a problem. I'll just say I had a problem. Well, I addressed it, and as you can see, I've got that purple, see the little purple thing in 2012? And look at where it went. It went down. Since September, or since 2012, my calcium score in score and volume has gone down 10.2%. Now, if you look at that purple thing, and I had, if I had a 15% pro progression, per the literature is what you're supposed to have, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Think about that. So as an engineer, you ask a simple question. What changed? What changed? That's, that's what's key in all of this. So there you go. If you look at that, I would say that's not bad. That's really not all that sneezily bad. You just, you just study that when it, you, it just, you kind of go, wow. Now, the rule of thumb with heart disease is measure it first. In other words, get your CT scan of your heart. It's $59, I think, at one hospital in Green Bay. And what was it, Roxana? 50, 50 bucks in another one? And they've got a 320 slice scanner, which is phenomenally accurate. And Gil, get your heart scanned. If you can find an EBT scanner, that's even better. But for the most part, a 320 slice scanner is the best thing for you. Now, some people will say, oh my God, you're getting all this radiation. No, you're not going to get, you're, you, you get the same amount of radiation as flying from Chicago to Tokyo. It's no big deal. It really is no big deal. And you're not doing it every day. You're doing it, say, once, once a year. But if you don't know, if you can't chart, chart the progress or the regression of your heart disease, it's very, very difficult to solve your problem. There's a saying, I forgot who said it, you can't hit a target you can't see, and you can't hit a target that you don't have. <laughs> right? Well, one could say, well, Pat, are you telling us this is the be-all and end-all? Absolutely not. Not even close. It's a part of the puzzle, but it's part of the target. You got a, you got a place to start. So get it measured. Green Bay is what, 90 miles down the road or 110? Yeah. So take an afternoon. Yes, ma'am. Don't they do it here? Don't know, but they, in, over in Green Bay, you can walk in and get it done. Uh, I hear, what are the, Bellin and Aspirus, I believe. Right? You, you got yours done, Rocks and what? Marinette. So, set yourself up for a shopping spree. <laughs> and, you know, do it at a Packer game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they have a Thursday night game, go over and get your heart scanned on Thursday and then go to the Packer game. You know, whatever. But measure it first. Now, now you go, gee, Pat, why? Well, in the world of engineering, we have something called DMAIC, D-M-A-I-C. And what that stands for is define the problem, measure the problem, analyze the problem. I, the I I like is innovate, and then control. And the control part is plan, do, check, act. Plan, do, check, act. In other words, if you don't have a plan, you don't know where you're going to end up. And just a couple of Sundays ago, I was talking to a physician up, up in the UP, and I says, 
Define for me heart disease. Remember, definition of terms makes a big difference. So who would like to define heart disease? Anybody? It's pretty complex, I'm sure. Many different ways your heart can fail. But it, right. What is heart disease, though? That's, that, it's a symptom. You're talking a symptom now. Now, you th now, this is important. Engineers don't talk in symptoms. We, the first thing we do is root cause failure analysis so as to come up with a definition of the D endemic. The D endemic is define the problem. That's what engineers do. What's Through, causing that heart disease? Right, the root cause of, you know, root cause. So root cause causes you to find the D in definition. That's what's, that is, so how do you define heart disease? Well, this physician, great guy, really good, good doctor, he defined it a number of different ways, all describing symptoms. Remember, wrong target. Got the wrong target, you're going to hit the wrong thing. So. Heart disease, in my opinion, is very simple. You have something growing in your artery that doesn't belong there. Now, what if you have something growing in your body that is made out of your own body's own cells, what would you also call that? Cancer. You could call heart disease cancer of the arteries of your heart. And there's some validity to that. Given, and I'm, I'll get into that, and why I say that. It's not just me. These other, other physicians who have defined it differently and defined other things differently have, have you know, said, yeah, it's probably, it seems to fit. So then you measure it. How do you measure it? You get a CT scan. Then you get all your bl various blood works. Then you measure all of the various vitamins that you're taking to, to solve the problem. Well... Okay, now that you've got all this information, now you've got to do something with it. You've got to innovate. Sometimes it's with assistance of, from the MDs, that's fine. They bring something to the party, there's no doubt about that. But they don't bring everything to the party. But like I tell folks, job one is take ownership in your problem. If you don't take ownership in your problem, and in case of heart disease, extreme ownership, guess what? You're going to have a problem. So, and then you start to innovate, and then that circle starts all over again. Keep testing and testing and testing and testing and testing. You don't do it every day. You don't do it every week. Twice a year. I used to do it quarterly. When I could, I used to get my heart scanned three times a year. And this one holistic MD cardiologist said, well, Pat, what about the radiation? It could kill you. I said, I'm going to die anyway, so it doesn't matter. I mean, come on. Come on, man. You know? Somebody has got to go after this thing instead of sitting back and waiting to have an opportunity. So from my years of playing ice hockey, it was called de defaulting aggressive. You never met a good hockey player that was timid. <laughs> you, you, just, you just don't. So I went after it. So that's the demeaning thing in root cause failure analysis. So as I kept drilling down, drilling down, drilling down, and I found all sorts of stuff. Within the first four months of me going after this thing in 2002 to 2003, heart disease is a gut bacteria problem. Heart disease is based on lack of vitamin D. Now remember, this is the first three, four months of me doing this. I didn't realize K had an impact on it at that time. I found it out later in 2010. Uh, I don't know, sugar's bad for you, grains are bad for you, you know, carbs will kill you, taking calcium supplements has a high per propensity of killing you, because your body's not designed to take exogenous calcium. This is all in the literature, this isn't somebody's wild machination, this is just what you, but we end up as a society into doing, doing strange things, kind of like, like, 
rooting for the Vikings. You know, you kind of wonder, you know. <laughs> or the Bears. <laughs> or the Bears. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's, it's kind of how, how this kind of, kind of shapes up. So by the end of the first three, four months, I pretty much identified 16 different things that made a difference in heart disease. By just reading the literature, the peer-reviewed literature on the internet, and Al Gore, thank you for the internet, appreciate it. And as a result, back then in 2002, 2003, all you had was scientific stuff out there. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, tri well-intentioned trivia. So one thing leads to another, and I had a few, you know, I cleaned up my left main, then I had a major speed bump. I'm not going to get into the major speed bump. And it was done by accident, not by design. And uh, my calcium score went crazy, but it still kept my left main clean. And by 2010, I was feeling kind of bummed out because I just couldn't quite turn that corner. And then 2010, I took a week off, and I spent a week rereading all of my literature that I had dove through. I spent close to 120 man hours in seven days reading, reading, and reading some more. And I came across a very obscure article by Dr. Mercola. Good guy. Mercola said, K has something to do with heart disease. And this was from a 1998 posting on the internet. And I went, huh. I, I, I can remember saying, I, K? K? Really? K? What's that? I, honest to God, I went, oh, really? OK. And then I remembered something this holistic MD cardiologist told me, that certain people in certain parts of Japan don't have very low incidence of heart disease because they eat natto. And natto has a form of K in it. And I went, OK, I got those two dots connected, kind of. It still didn't make any sense. So then I drilled down on the literature on K, which is, at the time, it was like, really? It was kind of witchcraft, really. It, to be very honest, it was witchcraft. And I go, hmm, OK. What do I do now? I went back through all of my blood work. I have a pile of blood. I, I should have, I've got it out in the car. It's a pile of, pile of paper bolt like that. AROX, it's, you know, 20 some odd heart scans. And I've got the CDs. So if you want to come up to my apartment and look at my CDs, you know, <laughs> we, can, we, we can all look at my <laughs> That's an old thing from the 60s. Uh, I, I digress. Anyway, uh, I looked at my blood work, and this holistic MD in Traverse City, by accident not, or by design, ordered up a K1 test for me a couple of years earlier. Just by accident. And K1 was low, even by the standards of the, of the medical world. I went, holy Hannah Pete, I think I got it. I was doing everything else right. So then I was off on my mission, and that's, that's where, how I've ended up here today. It's just on this mission of doing this. First, I had to find K, and thank God somebody had K on the internet, K1, only one supplier. And uh, nobody really had MK7 or MK4 in appreciable amounts. So now I had to go find my appreciable amounts of my MK4 and MK7. And so where do you go find MK4 and MK7? What I really <laughs> felt like when I discovered Supply Side West, which is this big vitamin conference in Las Vegas, I went there kind of like Cheech and Chong trying to score some stuff in Tijuana. You know? <laughs> hey, man, I want to score some K MK7. You got some? <laughs> <laughs> He's just kind of like, how do you start this? You know, how do you, how do, you do this? Where do you go? You know, it just, it is, you know, oh my God. It's kind of like that latest Clint Eastwood movie where he's driving the black Lincoln. That was about the only thing I, I was missing in all of this, you know. <laughs> so I eventually found my K. And what I, I got all my K together and I got my kilos of K. It was white powder too, you know. <laughs> And all this white powder all over my kitchen table. <laughs> and all these little pill man <laughs> making my own little pills, you know. Oh Lord, was I sketchy. Oh my God. So it, it's so I said, you know what, how do you know this is really gonna work? So what I did was I had squirreled away 
some statin. And I had already learned how to drive my LDL down to 60 nanograms per milliliter. So I drove it down there, just for giggles. Why? If I took K, and the body likes K, then guess what? My LDL and HDL should go up, because my body's going, woohoo, I got something I really need. So I, get my, I did the before and after, and my LDL went from 60 to about 135. Well, I was still taking a statin. My, my, my. I feel like, you know, Detective Kenda. <laughs> my, my, my. So you go, okay, really? So then I stopped taking the statin. So in theory, it should go up even higher, right? Didn't, stayed the same. And I, you know, it just, uh, and there's literature that supports that out there, that if you take K, it stabilizes your LDL. There's some literature out there that says that. So that's kind of interesting. So, okay, now I had to then figure out, remember the Demaic thing? I have to test. Now I had to find the uncarboxylated osteocalcin test. And I'm going, oh my God, that, that name's about that long. So I had to go find that. That was quite, quite the experience. And I got that going. And I got my K1 going. And then, my, then when I told that holistic MD in Traverse City what I was doing, she just about fell out of her chair. She says, you're going to clot your blood. No, I'm not going to clot my blood. Oh, she rushed me over to the hospital that I had done something completely bizarre. And she, the, my prothrombin time came back perfectly squared away. And I said, it's supposed to be perfectly squared away. So a little background on K is when you take K, your liver, it's called a triage theory of, uh, of vitamin K. When you take K, your liver does a lot of neat things with it, primarily to keep you from clotting or not clotting. Now, test question. If, you, if I magically sucked all the K out of you, you, everyone here, all gone, what do you think would happen? People think you'd what, bleed out, right? Because it's the clotting vitamin, right? Roxana, what happens? You clot up. The first rule of thumb K does is to keep you from clotting. Isn't that bizarre? You never heard that one, now have you? Again, it's all in the literature. So there you go. So then the next thing the, then the liver does is make sure all your clotting factors are made happy. And if you have anything left over, and most people don't, then it goes to all the other places in your body where you need it. The body does not store the MKs. It just doesn't. MKs last about three days. Then they're gone. The body stores a little bit of K1, and then it's gone too. Okay? So... When you hear it's fat soluble, and we're going to get into this, it doesn't hang around. That's why you need a constant dose of it. Okay? That's, that's that one. But again, takeaway off of this first slide, stop it. And how do you stop it? Measure, measure, measure. Measure and innovate, measure and innovate, measure and innovate. Okay? That's, that's step one. That's step one. Now, step two. Yes, I like your look. <laughs> the multi-headed dragon of heart disease. Now, the multi-headed dragon of heart disease. When you first look at this, you're going to go, Oh my God, I cannot address this. But remember, I'm an engineer. When you're an engineer, you always have a model of what you're going to go after. You have to have a model. So this is the model that I came up with. I first came up with it in 2003, but I had missed a few little salient points in there. One was K. I screwed that up. I admit to it. The next salient point is something called Feto and A, and that's something we'll cover later. Well, my, my, my. 
So if you look at this and how it's broken up, you ask yourself a very simple question. Are you, can you get your D right? Yeah. Okay, check that off the list. See how that easy it is? Just check it off the list. Can you get your thyroid right? Of course you can. Can you get your magnesium corrected? Oh, yeah. But if you didn't have all that on there and somebody says, this is the dragon that's going to kill you, guess what? Everybody goes, ooh, I can't do this, and they go run and hide. Okay? See how, see how that works? So let's just go around and trace metals. Well, you've all heard of chelation and all that stuff. Yeah? Just something to, junk food diet. Don't eat junk food. <laughs> Mechanical issues. Guess what? In the engineering world, and you know this, having worked in a paper mill, if it moves, it breaks, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Got another paper maker in here. Oh, yeah. A paper mill is full of pipes and pumps and electrical circuits and chemistry, right? A lot of emotion. <laughs> Lots of emotion. Lots of opinion. <laughs> Lots. So, so your arteries move. So if it keeps moving, eventually it's going to break. <laughs> it's just what it's going to do. It's going to crack. Okay? So you say, okay, how do you handle that? Well, part of that is vitamin C. Vitamin C makes elastin, and elastin makes your arteries elastic. So, so you guys can get vitamin C, right? It's pretty easy, right? It's cheap, too. Cheap? Oh, yeah, it's very cheap. So then you've got to do your amino acids, too. Lysine and citrulline, very, very good for you. Now you go, citrulline? Don't hear too much about that. You heard of arginine. Okay. Citrulline is made into arginine by the liver in a dose-dependent manner. If your body needs arginine and you have citrulline, it makes exactly how much you need. If you take arginine and you take too much, you kind of put a load on your liver and a few other things. So take your citrulline. Citrulline is great for your pipes. It also relaxes your pipes and so does uh, lysine. You say, how much? Uh, three to six grams a day of each, somewhere in there. It's a powder. If you guys like, guys and gals like smoothies, make it into a smoothie. You can do a lot of this into a smoothie. And half and half is good for you. Junk food diet, good fats are good fats. Bad fats are bad fats. So you don't want to do bad fats. So, gut bacteria. Boy, that's, that's something. What a that, I can only say, look at Fasano's videos on gut bacteria. You look at that and you go, oh my God. The gut has got anywhere between 600 and 4,000 different species of critters in there. And they're all doing a job. Now here's a piece of trivia. Let's say for some reason your body wanted calcium. Okay? For whatever reason, let's say you're a growing child and your body needs calcium, right? How does the calcium get from, how does the body tell the gut to liberate calcium out of the food that you're eating? What does it use? Vitamin D. Vitamin D is a signaling chemical and a few other things to tell the gut bacteria hey, I need some calcium. And the gut bacteria says, cool, I'll make some for you. Isn't that neat? Now, something else about calcium is that it's unbelievably regulated. It's highly regulated. It's used for pH control in your body, for one thing. So what you do with the pH control is you've got to keep it in a narrow band and your body does that automatically. Now there's some exceptions to all of this, but we're talking about the 80-20 rule here, what re most regular Joes go through. So it's uh, very regulated. So what happens is when you take exogenous, I love that word, exogenous, that sounds like something that, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got exogenous calcium. That means you've taken it. 
uh, you chew down a chunk of limestone and you kind of go, and the body goes, what am I going to do with this calcium? I got to put it somewhere. So what does the body do with it? Puts it in your heart, puts it in your joints. Yep, bad stuff. Don't take calcium unless you really have found that you really need it. And for some odd reason, your diet and your D and everything is so screwed up, you got to have it. Be really cautious. Be really, 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 really cautious. Okay. So, and also with the gut bacteria, one of the things that I did in the paper industry is I helped design and build and run and figure out how to make it work uh, the world's largest intestine. We kind of go, what's the world's largest intestine? Well, there was a factory in the upper Midwest that took maple trees. And what's in a maple tree? Sugar. Maple sugar. You got her. Well, we took, and this is kind of a, a crazy thing, we took the maple sugar and we made methane and carbon dioxide out of it. Oh, she got one. 250 tons a day of maple sugar. <laughs> And we, and it was quite an experience to get that thing to work, but it was all using anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic bacteria is what's in your gut. So by default, from 2006 through 2000, roughly 11, I got to understand in excruciating detail how to make anaerobic bacteria really happy. Uh, wow, that's all I can say. But bacteria is a big deal. And that is why, now here's something really cool. There is a physician in South Africa by the name of Dr. Tim Noakes, N-O-A-K-E-S. His YouTube videos are stunning. Noakes talks about people eating once a day. He says that's what we're designed to do. Isn't that cool? Once a day. And you should eat between 5 and 7 o'clock. Okay, that's what he says. So you go, oh my God, why are we doing that? Well, this is where the gut bacteria play. If you have a bolus of food, it's going through all your intestine, it's going to go through at a certain rate, a certain speed. It's like driving down I-39 when there's a blizzard going on. You're going to go at a certain speed. Okay? Well, if you keep putting boluses every three to four hours down your gut, what's going to happen? Gut's going to go, i got to do something with this stuff. It's got to go out the south end quickly because it won't allow you to fill up. Okay, follow me? So what happens? As that bolus is going through your gut, the body is sending signals to your gut bacteria of, hey, I need this chemical, hey, I need that chemical, hey, I need this, hey, I need that. And in order to do that, your gut bacteria have to grow. Some species are, say, in, in short supply. They've got to grow. It's called doubling rate. So they've got to grow. Well, if they're not allowed to grow effectively, in other words, you get enough of your, their buddies, you're not going to get the proper kind of nutrition into your system. And that's something. So that's why you have to give the bacteria time enough to take from your food what you need because of the signaling from your body. Isn't that something? That's, that's fascinating as all get out. Noakes came up with that kind of stuff. And it's valid, it's inferentially validated by Damasio, or, or uh, Fasano, not Damasio. That's kind of neat stuff. So as we go around this, we have also autoimmune issues. That's, that's another little speed bump that I'm not really prepared to talk about right now, but it can make a difference. And then you go up the thing to insulin and glucose. Don't dine on sugar. Your typical colas that you can buy in the store have a, it, they put it in grams. Do you ever notice the sugar that's in there? In grams. You know why they do that? Because most folks in the U.S. wouldn't know a gram from a grandpa. So, <laughs> And it's typically 100 grams, right? Do you know how much a 100 grams is? 
It's a quarter of a pound. Now, if you took a quarter of a pound of sugar and put it in your hand and say, hey, suck this down, what do you think you would do? Sure, hey, sign me up for that one. Nobody's going to do that. But yet, that's what's in there. Isn't that something? Now, insulin has to be properly managed. Vitamin K makes a difference in how your pancreas works. It's not the be-all and end-all, but it's part of the program. Okay. Something else about gut bacteria and vitamin K. Gut bacteria like vitamin K. Now, this is crazy. Remember, your gut bacteria have to eat too, you know. And gut bacteria need vitamins also. That is rarely ever talked about. So when you see some of these studies on certain forms of K, they say, oh, the K just disappeared. An engineer says, where'd it go? It didn't disappear. It went somewhere, somehow, some way, and did something. Heaven only knows what it did, but it did something. It's like being in a paper mill. If you have a, 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 what's called a pulper full of stock, imagine a, a wearing blender with a couple of tons of, of, of tissue paper in there being mixed up. And you come back an hour later and you go, where'd it go? And everybody goes, we don't know. I said, what happened? Did the, uh, the pulp fairy come by and take it and make it disappear? It went somewhere and it did something. But that's how engineers look at things. Like, Wait a minute. It, 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 no, it did something. So if you look at that vitamins help your bacteria in your gut and they help you so it's kind of a symbiotic relationship is the fancy term there kind of neat kind of neat and also the body sends signals to your gut bacteria of the various forms of k that you need isn't that something the body will say hey i need some mk13 yeah i got you covered and truly you did those double benzene rings with that little tail on it. It's called an isoprene unit. Look, I call them polywogs. Got this little head, and you got this tail. And you can, you know, does that. So the gut bacteria says, yeah, I can make that. Give me an isoprene unit. Yeah, I can do that. Bingo. They kick out a K kale molecule, and the liver says, cool, man, I'm all set. Isn't that something? That's what your gut bacteria are doing for you. So you have to give it what's called the precursor. The precursor. And it's the precursors that make such a difference. Some of the precursors are astaxanthin. The bacteria not only use that to convert to other things, astaxanthin also gets carried into your body. But the bacteria use it too. Uh, and, uh, what, what would you call those? At, anthrocyanins that you find in uh, tart red cherry and blueberry well those are good for you no doubt about that tart red cherry is is the bomb that stuff is that the tart red cherry juice powder eighth of a teaspoon a day huh hog heaven if you're an athlete no soreness but it's also a precursor for your body to make other chemicals from isn't that neat so it's it's your gut is a really busy system. And we're only now starting to understand it, not we. Well, I know how to make methane out of maple syrup, but anyway. You should see it when you get sick bacteria in that size. It costs us a million bucks just to fix the thing. A million dollars. A million dollars worth of gut bacteria. Isn't that cool? <laughs> wow. So anyway but I could wax poetically about that, that event. Uh, in a 2008 presidential campaign, Barack Obama referenced the place as, bi as being bioenergy whatever, which was pretty cool. It, it was pretty neat. It, it was really a neat thing that I was part of. So anyway, insulin, glucose, exogenous, oh, autoimmune issues. Let's talk about exogenous chemistry. Don't smoke. Don't, just don't smoke. Now, I got something for you. How many people here know somebody who smokes like a chimney and is fine? And they're in their 70s or 80s. Yeah. 
Turns out they've got a gene to tolerate cigarette smoke. Uh, and, uh, okay. That's one of those one percenters. They're, they're way out there. Anyway. So, statins, warfarin, we talked about calcium, phosphorus. Let's talk about phosphorus. Where is the highest amount of phosphorus that people get exposed to? Colas. Loaded with phosphorus. What does phosphorus do? Sucks, sucks, out, sucks out your magnesium. It preferentially takes your magnesium, takes it through your kidneys, and out she goes. So the rule of thumb is don't put phosphorus in your system. <laughs> don't do that. Isn't that neat? Hey, but, but when you start to see this multi-headed dragon simplistically like this, it's not that scary. It's kind of, kind of straightforward. So, uh, statins. Okay, now, that, now there's about 5% of the people out there that need statins. That's, they just do. That's, that's a whole other story. But I'm not talking about the 5%ers. They've got to have it. Now, what do statins do? Lower your, lower your LDL. Okay, hold that thought. What else does it do? Yeah. No, it doesn't make your triglycerides go up. It can cause wasting of muscles. Oh, yeah. I, I did that to myself, yeah. Precisely. Excellent answer. CoQ10 is the next step in the malevolate cycle. The first thing you do is you drop the LDL, and the next thing you know, you stop making CoQ10. Now, why is CoQ10 so important? It's a, it's, it works on the surface of the mitochondria in your cells to make your pump pump correctly and your muscles muscle correctly. Way back when, I got to talk to a researchist, a K researchist, who shared with me and my, my, my partner there about CoQ10. In, what was it, the original patent had CoQ10 added to the statin? And then they took it out. My, my, my. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. Well, uh, there was a whole lot of reasons, but let's put it this way. They recognized back then that if you gave a person a statin, their CoQ10 levels would plummet. So you are seeing increasing amounts of cardiologists now recommending that people take ubiquinol while they're on a statin. That's a good thing. Okay, right, I'm not going to, you know, it's okay, that's what it is. More and more doctors are doing that, which is cool. Now, we get to warfarin. Warfarin is typically found with uh, atrial fibrillation type folks. <coughs> it's been around since the 40s. The issue with warfarin is that it induces hardening of the arteries. Statins induce type 2 diabetes, and warfarin induces hardening of the arteries. And because of that, that's why they're working on the, what, the dabagatrins rocks? There's a, the dabagatrins are designed to tolerate K. Warfarin, if you're on warfarin and you take a K product, you're, you're, you can screw things up. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Work with your doctor on it. See if you can get on a dabagatrin and go from there. Uh, it's, 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 it's amazing how you fix one problem and all of a sudden three or four more come out of the woodwork. Just, just, just amazing. Uh, APOE status is something else that's really important. That's a gene. You, your APOE or APO epsilon gene, I, they, they always have these great, that goes along with exogenous. Uh, you need to know about your APOE status. You're either 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, or 2, 3, 3, 4, or 2, 4. If you have the 4 allele, the stuff that I'm talking about today 
doesn't exactly apply. So heads up. In fact, all of this needs to be modified, but it's not insurmountable. You just got to really pay attention to a few things. Okay. Typically, typically, you 80% of the people are not APOE 44, 43, or 42. But get it checked. Again, part of the Demaic. Measure it. Analyze it. See what you got. And then adjust your vitamins appropriately. Adjust your personal care physician appropriately. Work with them. Work with them to say, I'm APOE 4, what do I do? How do I do it? That's important. They need to be part of this too. And if you can find an integrative medicine physician or a naturopath, that's what you do. You know, work with them. Just work with them. Don't think that this multi-headed dragon you have to do by yourself. Okay. So let's see, what else have we got? Uh, we talked about low-Q10. Viruses and bacteria. Viruses and bacteria, moles, mildews, funguses, and God only knows what else that we ingest, can and do attack arteries. Okay. And what are we all familiar with with regards to sources of bacteria that can attack arteries? It is, anyone? Tooth disease. My, my partner over there, her and I have a friend. He just had his, a valve replaced, not in his car, but in his pump, you know. And with the VA, okay, you know what they made mandatory? Take all his teeth out. Why? Because they found that rejection rates on artificial valves has to do, in large part, to bacterial infections coming from your teeth. My, my, my. Isn't that something? So what happens? You get viruses, bacteria, moles, mildews, funguses, God only knows what, gets into your system, finds a home in one of your pipes because the pipe is moving and it cracked. Okay, we talked about cracking. Cracked. Gets in there. And now you got a problem. Sometimes. You go, that's a problem all the time. Mm -mm. So what happens is, and this is just a sidebar, Let's say you get a bacteria in your artery. Bacteria got the artery all upset, so the artery sends out a fire alarm. Your white blood cells go in there to kill the bacteria. That's what they do. They go in there to kill the bacteria. Big time. They go in there and kill it. And once they kill it, what do they do? Any idea? They leave the artery, take the bacteria with it. Bet you didn't hear that one. It's some really good work on that. The, the neutrophil, as an example, will go in there, kill the bacteria, and leave. Squeezes right through. Okay? And that's, isn't that cool? Some of the little things that you kind of, you know, it's kind of neat stuff. So anyway, what else do we have floating around here? Uh, over here we got low D. We're all familiar with why low D was a big deal. Back in 2002, 2003, I had to drive from Upper Michigan to Milwaukee to get my D tested because nobody tested because no, no, no personal care physician thought it was important. Now you think about what it was like 16 years ago. Just to find D on the internet in a, in a level that you could take without taking 50 of them was almost impossible. The biggest, I think, was 1,000 IUs at the time. Unbelievable. Anyway, we've, so free T3. Who here knows what free T3 is? Oh, it's T3 you don't have to pay for. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. It's the thyroid. It's thyroid. Free T3 is implicated in heart disease. And I'll get into how, all, that's why I have this highlighted in yellow. We can get into those details later. In other words, get your thyroid correct. And it has to do with how, eh, it's a long story. We'll get into that in a second. Then you got, uh, I talked about the junk food and all that stuff. And this last one was really interesting. is LDL, HDL, surface chemistry. So here, who here has had a course in surface chemistry? 
You have. Okay, good. You got Swanson's book from what I hear. Yeah, okay. I had Swanson. Pretty good guy. Who here has ever done laundry? You've all experienced surface chemistry when you do laundry. If you don't have your surface chemistry right, your clothes don't get clean. It's all about the surface of things. Who here has slid through an intersection in the wintertime in Wisconsin? We all have, you know? That's a surface chemistry problem. The surface of the street and the chemistry of your tire don't exactly like each other, okay? Follow me on this? Now you're going to go, how in the heck does all that fit together? And so I'll get into that in a, in a bit. But it's a surface chemistry issue. So that's, that's the multi-headed dragon. If there's one takeaway, you can do this. It's not mystifying. It shouldn't be intimidating. But it's a model that you can work from. And then you can add your own little, little thingies to it if you want. So the next one. Oh, you guys are going to like this one. It's not the best in the world, but I think it's a pretty good one. Right there, got it? Okay, who here has heard of fat-soluble vitamins? We all have, yeah. Yeehaw! Anybody ever wonder how all those fat-soluble vitamins get around your body? <laughs> well, you got pixie dust makes, it, makes the stuff go all over the place? No! You got little trucks that take this stuff around. And I use milk trucks because they're kind of fat, you know, other than the uh, old style uh, UPS truck, which, and the uh, US mail. Think about this LDL carries a bunch of things, TRLs, triglyceride rich lipoproteins, they carry stuff. Very large density lipoproteins, VLDL, they carry stuff. Chylomicrons, they carry all sorts of stuff. Chylomicron remnants carry K1 and, and the MKs. DBP carries vitamin D. But you never hear of any of this stuff being talked about. You look at all of the literature, 99% of it, would you say that rocks, 99% of it, when they do a study on LDL and heart disease or HDL and heart disease or heart disease in general, and all of the stuff associated with it, they never come back and say, what's in the truck that just drove by? Right? Think about it. LDL carries K1. It carries it. it. Carries the MKs. It carries E. It carries 10. So if you take CoQ10, you pop the pill, you buy, buy your CoQ10 or Biquinol from here, take your CoQ10, pop it down your gut, bacteria goes, whoo, we can use some of it, but we're going to give the rest of it to the body. The chylomicrons eventually get it to the LDL, and the LDL gets it to your cell. Isn't that cool? No, you've heard it here first, folks. This is how this works. You got to, I, I used to call them dump trucks, but I thought this was a better graphic. Milk trucks, because milks carry fat. Now, we've got a U.S. mail truck here in the middle. HDL carries stuff out there, like the mail, and carries stuff back. They go in both directions. Follow me? Now, we'll get into re what's called reverse cholesterol transport here in a bit, but HDL carries stuff back to the liver, and it carries stuff from the liver. And then you've got this thing called Fetoin A. Now, who here has heard of Fetoin A? Nobody. What is Fetoin A? It's the truck... It's the delivery van that hauls your calcium around your body. And it gets it to where it needs to go, like to your bone. And guess what Fetoin A also does? It is 
part of the surface chemistry issue that we're going to be talking about, FETO1A helps remove the calcium out of your artery and either brings it to the liver or brings it to bone to be redeposited. Isn't that cool? My, my, my. So, this is what's going on and how we get from point A to point B. So, ask a couple of simple questions. If you take something that lowers your LDL, what's it going to do? It's going to lower... There's a reason for it, though. There's, there's, there's logic to this, which is bizarre, but there is logic to it. But you lower the opportunity, or the opportunity to bring enough fat-soluble vitamins, those three, out to where you need, need to get it. And your body has all these feedback loops and feed-forward loops, same in instrumentation and controls. So the body keeps saying, hey, I need some. So the liver goes, I'll make you some. Hey, bacteria, they got, make me some, okay. And fire it off, send it over. Yeehaw, we got her. If you don't have enough delivery trucks, then you're not going to get it. Precisely. You're not going to get enough because you can only pack so much in a delivery truck. Precisely. My, my, my. So what else does LDL do, as an example? Every hormone in your body is made from LDL. So if you make your LDL disappear, what's going to happen to your hormonal levels? They're going to drop. You're going to mess with them. Exactly. So as an engineer, why do you want to do that? <laughs> I don't know. I wish I did know, but I don't. So, you see, I ask questions based on simple logic and straightforward stuff. And it's, and it's, it's I, I would be called a fresh set of eyes. Or, as my dad used to say, new brooms always sweep clean. I got a background in science. I'm highly motivated not to die. And I want to solve this problem. So I take a very fresh approach to this. Another problem with LDL levels is when your hormones drop, you have the propensity of getting cancer. Uh, Johns Hopkins did a study on uh, D levels in cancer. And I believe those were the people that did the study on uh, LDL levels in cancer. I believe it was them. Don't know. I kind of try to remember it. But anyway, as you're, you need to have your LDL over 110. That's what the literature appears to indicate. But you don't need it over 175. Also, if you eat a fat, it doesn't screw up your cholesterol. If you eat cholesterol, it doesn't screw up your cholesterol. That doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. So, anyway. So, if you drop your LDL and you drop your MKs, but more importantly, you drop your K1. What happens when you drop your K1 levels? You're prone to getting Alzheimer's. That's from the Canadian government research by a researcher by the name of Furlan. And she modeled exactly how an LDL particle with a vitamin K1 attached, with part of its tail cut off, whatever, goes winging around the body, goes, goes through the artery of the heart, and there's an enzyme on the inside layer of the artery, remember this is surface chemistry now, that, art, that, that enzyme is activated. Inside the brain it goes, hey, dude, I need some sleeping material for my freaking nerves. Okay, I'll get you one. Here, here comes an LDL particle, SXR enzyme, SXR enzyme gets activated, grabs onto the particle, pulls it off the LDL particle, brings it through the wall, surface chemistry stuff, and then it's remanufactured in the brain into MK4. But MK4 can't go in the brain, but K1 can. God only knows why. I didn't invent this system, I just have to deal with it. And then the sheathing material for your nerves are made from the MK4. So now you say, people with MS, terrible disease, M MK4 synthesis is implicated in that too. So is there, a, is there a 
you know, there's something's going on there. Don't know what for sure. So, so there's one good example. Now, I didn't mention uh, magnesium in this, uh, but magnesium is really important for heart disease in that we've got the phetoin and A going in there and pulling out the uh, calcium. But the magnesium floating around also helps liberate it. But the magnesium is just carried in the serum. And the serum will dis the magnesium in the serum will displace the calcium that's in the pipe, and it'll help the uh, phetoin and A get rid of your uh, heart, uh, hardening of the arteries. Now, before I get into this next slide, there's the latest, the latest narrative that's out there is that you want hard arteries, right? You've probably heard this. Oh, you want the calcification. Yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding. It, it's, you want your, the body's doing that to make that pipe good and rigid. I'm not kidding. It's, that's, that's, that is in the literature and supported. Not with sound engineering, but it's supported. So you, you go, okay, let's, let's make sure we understand each other here. Your pump is your heart. It's a positive displacement pump. It goes wakata, and you've got this ball of liquid heading down this pipe. Okay? It's got a check valve, so it doesn't go wakata walk in the wrong direction. So it goes toot, 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 valve closed. Now you've got this pulsation of liquid going down this pipe. A normal artery has elastin. Remember I mentioned elastin. It expands, and as that pressure wave comes through, it contracts, expands, and contracts, and helps push everything where it's supposed to go. Okay. Now, surface chemistry issue. What happens if you don't have the going on? Your blood... It's full of stuff that doesn't like shear. So if you got it all rigid and you go walk it up and you go, it's that that energy starts to get transmitted to all the little particles that are in there that don't like to be sheared. So you have this wad of liquid heading to a branch somewhere, and it hits the branch really hard. You think that's a wise thing? Nah, that's not a wise thing. So, you're an engineer. What happens when you hit something with, boom, yeah, she pops, right? So, the folks that talk about calcification of the artery is a good thing, mm, an engineer would disagree with you. Uh, because when you make a pipe rigid, bad things always happen. They just, just, they just always happen. So, that was that. Now, let's talk about this next one is this is what's going on in your pipe. That's what's going on in your pipe right there. Okay? That's the very last slide. It's a, now, this is where the surface chemistry comes into play, and you know what? It can get kind of confusing, but I'm going to ask you some simple questions. Remember I mentioned about that bacteria getting into your pipe, and, the, and uh, your body said, well, i got to go kill that little bugger, okay? Well, sometimes that uh, monocyte, which could be a neutrophil, any of one of your white blood cells. Sometimes that monocyte becomes a bad actor and doesn't die or leave. Okay? Then it becomes a macrophage. Oh, I love these names. That goes along with exogenous. You know? And then a bunch of stuff happens. I love stuff. It's a, it's a great catch-all phrase. Stuff happens. And you end up with a foam cell, and that foam cell has a necrotic core. Wow, that sounds bad. That's as bad as a government shutdown. We have a necrotic core. Oh, my God. I think we need a wall around it. I don't know. 
Okay. Remember, your body doesn't do anything capriciously or arbitrarily. Don't ever forget that. The body has a real plan for everything. Do I profess to know all the plans? Uh-uh, not even close. I got some clues, though. We're on the target. I'm not going to say I'm in the, te in the bullseye, but I'm hitting the target. So now you've got these neutrophils that go in there and kill something, and they don't want to leave. And they turn into macrophages, and then they turn into foam cells. One of the things that the science types don't ask, but engineering types do ask, is why is it that the LDL goes in there in the first place? Any idea? Well, I don't know. Now, this is where it's going to get kind of heady, so kind of bear with me. The body knows that those macrophages and foam cells don't belong there. The body does know that. The body is told by the macrophages and foam cells through chemicals like tumor necrosis factor alpha, there's something going on in there that ain't supposed to go be going on there. It's kind of like you got three, four kids in the bedroom and the door is locked and mom goes, what's going on? Nothing. Nothing's going on. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody's in here but us chickens, you know. So you ask yourself, what in the devil is the LDL doing in there? Why there? Why? Well, if you look at the surface, and this is where it gets kind of heady, so if, if I, please, ask questions as I walk through this because it's not all that intuitively obvious. The LDL, I'll go through the simple version, the LDL connects and hooks up to the macrophage or to the foam cell and kills it. How does it kill it? It appears to kill it using K1 or MK7, probably MK7. It kills it. Now you go, Pat, how did you come up with that thought? Well, as an engineer, it's called inferential engineering. It's like the old saying, do you ever go to a philosophy class and you say, well, if a tree fell in the woods, does it make noise? You know, an engineer in a philosophy class, it's like a, you know, oil and water, that don't mix. So I said to the professor, yes, it makes noise. How do you know? You weren't there. I said, well, if a tree falls, it moves through air. If it moves through air, anything moving through air makes noise. That's physics. He went, oh. <laughs> Okay, so that's inferential engineering. You take the body of knowledge associated with mathematics and physics and chemistry and you kind of go, well, you know what, when you ruled out the logical, the rational, and the reasonable, the only thing that's left is the illogical, the irrational, and the unreasonable. In other words, inferential engineering, this is, that's got to be what's going on. If it isn't, let's go back to the very first slide. How do you explain me cleaning up my arteries? Something happened and it all started when I started taking K and getting all the other heads of that dragon slain. Okay. You following me with this? Am I, am I, am, is this working out okay for you folks? So then you say, well, what other objective evidence do you have? Well, make a long story short, the HDL goes in there too. Doesn't show it in here, but the HDL goes in there and it goes after the necrotic core. God almighty, I'm telling you, some of the names they come up with. So the HDL goes in there, and thanks to the K that's on the HDL, it mates up with the surface of the foam cell. Okay, remember that surface chemistry stuff I was telling you about? And it, much like a vampire, sucks the LDL out of the foam cell. <laughs> Takes it and then sneaks back through the epithelial layer and goes back to the liver to be reprocessed. Isn't that something? So you got a couple of surface chemistry things going on. The LDL goes to the macrophage and kills the macrophage. If it can't kill a macrophage, it can kill, kill a foam cell. So you ask yourself as an engineer, why is the LDL being hoarded? Well, it's being hoarded because the body's got to do something with it. So it's building up in the system when in reality the LDL was there to kill the bloody bugger. You follow me on this? It's kind of a torpedo, it's a chemical torpedo. And if it's done right, the HDL goes in there and 
sucks out the LD, sucks out the goo, and goes back to the liver and and everybody's happy. So basically, and there's some other things going on with the calcification of the vascular smooth muscle cells. These are some more great terms. And what goes on there, basically the FETO and A, also because of surface activity, is allowed to go in there and clean out the calcium with help from magnesium. Now, please ask questions right now. That's, that's a whole lot of biochemistry and physiology that's kind of, yeah, can be really, really, really mystifying. Don't hesitate to ask, please. It did. No. RF and a Yeah. Yeah. I take them all at once. Baby aspirin? No, they're adults. And I take the aspirin. Uh, the question is, how much adult aspirin do I take a day? Uh, I've been taking adult aspirin since the 60s from all my hockey time. It just kind of keeps me <laughs> mobile. <laughs> and I take. And aspirin works on two systems. There's a COX-1 and COX-2. Baby aspirin works on COX-1. It's an inflammatory pathway. COX-2 <coughs> is a different pathway, but you need enough K to make that work. Okay? I don't know how much you need, but I know four, three to four work for me. I'm happy. I know it works because I don't feel like I got hit by a truck or checked by somebody in a hockey rink or taking a puck in the head. So that's what I do. And now as for bleeding, it doesn't matter. Absolutely doesn't matter. I was doing that before I was taking it. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. Take your K. I have a brother-in-law that's a bleeder, and I don't know that they diagnosed it. The question is, somebody who bleeds a lot, there, there are some other genetic factors, such as factor V Leiden and things like that, that can make a difference. Again, Work with your personal care physician, get the facts, and then, again, the DMAIC. Define the problem, measure it, innovate, okay? And control it. It's, it's pretty, it's, it, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's not real. It's, you know, you're driving your car down I-39. Define the problem. You got ice in the roads. Measure it. You look at your speedometer. You analyze it, say, should I really be out here? <laughs> right, right? We all ask that question, right? So then you innovate. There's an exit. I'm going off the expressway. I'm going to go drive on the surface street because it's safer. And then you control it. You don't drive like a maniac down a two-lane uh, two, two highway. We all do DMA, I, DMA IC all the time. It's just applying it in different ways. So, okay. sure. Um, just in, since we're on the aspirin thing right now, just a mm -hmm. quick thing. If, I don't know if you had looked into or someone had mentioned to me that you take the precursor to acetylsalicylic acid, which is aspirin, um, from willow bark extract that doesn't cause bleeding, but you still get the same benefits. I haven't really read into it a, a ton, but it's out there mm -hmm. that you can take Get it from the actual natural, you know, source that it's in a form that your body can use, but it doesn't cause a bleeding. Something worth looking into. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. There, the the beauty of Mother Nature is there's many alternative pathways to solving problems. That's why in the body, you say, well, gee, I'm still alive and I don't have a lot of MK7 or MK4 in my system. Yeah, but the alternative pathways cause you to age for starters, and then die at an early death. They get an early one because the alternative pathways cost you longevity. So it works. That's the triage methodology of the body. One thing I want to say, if we do want to, did you have a, uh, a kind of wrap up your points about the uh, heart uh, thing before we kind of get into questions? Sure, I'd like to, like to do a quick wrap up. You First sure. of all, how about you, we do a quick wrap up? Uh, MK7, K1 uh, are important, but not the be-all and end-all for managing heart disease. 
That's, that's it in a nutshell. The chemistry of it is kind of complicated, but uh, it's straight. It's, if you just relax and just think about it, it's pretty straightforward. Your milk, milk trucks take your fat-soluble vitamins all over your body. So, you know, that's how it gets from point A to point B. But bottom line on D, K is you can't take too much of it, and your body loves it. And, uh, and you would say that most people don't get enough. Not even K, close. Yeah, not even close. Right. And, and things. Right. Okay. So to test for it to see if you're getting enough MKs in your system, K1 is a pretty simple, straightforward test. If you're taking a K supplement, the K1 test doesn't won't work. But the uncarboxylated osteocalcin test does tell you what your MK levels are by inference. And you cannot be fully carboxylated. And again, here we go, more terminology. Carboxylated, wow, that's right up there with all the other terms that we heard today. Why? Because there are some reactions in your body that require uncarboxylated osteocalcin. And what bone, some of the bone reactions, right, Rox, has, has to do with it. Uh, the research from Japan shows that MK4 and MK7, K1, along with big D, even D, Appears to stop and reverse osteoporosis. Uh, how much do you need? Somewhere between 50 and 75 milligrams a day of MK4. Uh, somewhere in there. Uh, people have talked about the source of MK7. I'm allergic to soy. The stuff is made from chickpea on, on the industrial level because soy is so inefficient. MK7 is pretty much made from a bacteria called bacteria subtilis. It's in your gut. But so you just feed it the right stuff and it gives you the right stuff. And, and the reason why they do that at the industrial level, other than the fact that soy is inefficient, is that there are so many concerns out there, many of them valid, some of them not so valid, that you don't want what's called soy isolates anywhere near people. Some people are more sensitive to them than others. That's just how it is. Uh, it, Roxanne, is there anything else you think I should add? In terms of the carboxylation, is there a difference? What, Pifka? Well, to be carboxylated, the proteins go to the body and the proteins go to the body. Okay, I can, I can, okay. My, my partner here brought up a very good point. What's carboxylation? There are 17 K-dependent proteins in your body. 17. And more are being discovered every year. The K, I'll just put, I'll give you simple, simple chemistry. The K makes those proteins really happy. As an example, really happy matrix GLA proteins, that's their name. Again, another term, about that long. Matrix GLA proteins are found on the surface of foam cells and macrophages. My, my, my. And, they're, and the only thing that makes them activated is that K goes in there and it goes, gotcha. Fascinating, isn't it? So matrix GLA proteins are implicated in a whole lot of things. For instance, if you had no K1 in your diet, your body is smart enough to use MK7 as a surrogate for K1. So that's why you take sufficient K1 to make your liver happy and all your clotting factors. And by the way, your prothrombin time will not change. You'll get to a certain level and just stay right there. And then the MKs and the K1s are then go trucked throughout your body and do their thing. And like I said, if you don't have sufficient MKs floating around or K1, your body has alternative ways of getting around that problem. Okay, that's, that's really about it on that part.